Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Last Jedi will be upon us within a week, so I'd like to take this time to talk a little bit more about the First Order. A few videos ago, we talked about how the Empire transitioned into the First Order. Today, we'll talk about the upgrades this new organization made to their ships, because they had to have evolved somehow, right? They're not going to do the same thing over again. Giant walkers advancing on rebel shield generators. <laughs> that won't happen again, right? Right? J JJ? Ryan? Mickey? Now, in all seriousness, though, the First Order has learned somewhat from the mistakes of the Empire. One of the most glaring issues with the Imperial Navy was their standard TIE fighter. It was completely outclassed by rebel snub fighters like the X-Wing and A-Wing. Despite its superior mobility, TIE fighters lacked shielding, which made them vulnerable targets in a dogfight. Shrapnel or stray shots that would bounce off the shield of a rebel snub fighter could tear right through a TIE fighter. The Imperial ships also lacked a proper life support system, which forced the pilots to wear evac suits. The lack of hyperdrives further limited the range of these ships, essentially tethering them to larger Imperial ships. The Rebels took full advantage of this. One of their favorite strategies were to carry out quick slash and run attacks by appearing and disappearing from hyperspace after launching a payload of proton torpedoes. The B-Wing, which saw action later in the Galactic Civil War, was solely designed for this purpose. So what did the First Order do to make things better? Well, first they increased the survivability of their standard TIE fighters. The First Order lacked the same kind of resources that the Empire had access to, so they didn't treat their TIE fighter pilots as cannon fodder. This meant the new TIE fighter had an upgraded power source, weapons, and more importantly, shielding. They still considered adequate life support as communist. But now that the Republic was larger than the First Order, they wanted to give themselves the ability to carry out slash and run attacks as well, and incorporated a hyperdrive into the ship's design. This allowed them to quickly insert and extract themselves during snatch and grab missions, like the one over Maz Kanata's castle. There was also a Special Forces version of the First Order TIE Fighter, which had upgraded weapons, including a rear turret for a gunner. Imperials like Thrawn had already noticed the inherent weakness of the Imperial Fighter and had begun creating prototype fighters like the Defender, and they were causing a headache for the Rebellion. The Defender had many similar properties like more powerful engines and the addition of shields and a hyperdrive. So the First Order is definitely on the right path with their new TIE Fighter design. On the other side, the Resistance only made incremental upgrades to the venerated T-65 X-Wing. This was partly due to corruption and the bureaucratic nonsense that is often associated with the Republic. There was also a massive move to demilitarize the new Republic Navy after the Battle of Jakku. So the Resistance was left flying deactivated T-70s, which essentially is like a yearly Call of Duty update. Sure, there's some cosmetic changes and some new bullet points on the back of the box, but it's pretty much just the same game. Although it should be noted that the T-70s are slowly getting phased out and being replaced by the T-85 X-Wing, which is basically the latest Call of Duty with the Season Pass. Now let's move on to capital ships. From what we know, it's been confirmed that Palpatine's Super Star Destroyer Eclipse has survived the Galactic Civil War. We also know about the new Mega Star Destroyer class ship, which will serve as Snoke's base of operations. But the backbone of the fleet will be made up of Resurgence class Star Destroyers, which was inspired by the Imperial class Star Destroyer. The Resurgence class Star Destroyer was twice as large as the Imperial class and featured an extremely strong superstructure and reinforced bulkheads, along with upgraded shielding, power sources, and weapons. Some Resurgence class Star Destroyers use kyber crystals to increase energy output. This made the Resurgence class Star Destroyer faster than a TIE fighter. Although the ship had less stormtroopers stationed on board, it had a larger group of fighters, similar to the Republic ships of old. Using multiple hangars and mechanized deployment systems, the entire ship's complement of TIE fighters could be deployed within minutes. The bridge of the Resurgence was heavily shielded, and redundant control systems were placed at different control centers in case some A-Wing wants to Admiral Akbar through the bridge. The rest of the First Order fleet was made up of Imperial-class Star Destroyers that managed to escape the Unknown Region. Because of the lack of manpower, the First Order automated the maintenance of these ships, which significantly cut down the size of the crew. The First Order also had several support ships, but we haven't seen much of them yet. Replacing the Imperial Light Cruiser was the Dissident Light Cruiser which is kind of an odd name for a fascist organization, where usually dissidence is frowned upon. The light cruiser was specifically designed to be able to dock with the nose of the resurgence class. 
Then there was the Nebulon K frigate, which looks quite similar to the Nebulon B frigate, an Imperial escort ship which was constantly being stolen by the Rebel Alliance. Rounding out the rest of the First Order's escort fleet was the Maxima A-class heavy cruiser. Not much is known about that ship yet. For Grand Assaults, the First Order used the Atmospheric Assault Lander, which is basically a flying Higgins boat. It had a forward-facing ramp which encouraged even the most cowardly soldiers to disembark, but also had the added benefit of being able to quickly deploy troops. For more special and entitled individuals, there was the, the Upsilon class command shuttle, inspired by the Lambda class T4A shuttle. The Upsilon featured the same folding wings, which made storage easier, and although the ship was better equipped and larger, it relied on an extremely powerful sensor array to detect enemies and stay undetected. The First Order was supposed to have learned from the mistakes of the Empire. The contingency plan was created to make sure that all former mistakes would be fixed. On paper, at least, it seems like the First Order has improved in almost every category. Yet, on a strategic level, it seems like the organization is still relying on ridiculous super weapons like Starkiller Base. With trailers of The Last Jedi already promising large battles in between the Resistance and the First Order, and potentially even the New Republic, it should be interesting to see how much more advanced the First Order vessels actually are. Has the New Republic updated its ships? Or will this be Poland versus Germany circa 1939 all over again? Well, if you hit that subscribe and notification button, we'll let you know as soon as we do. Because we are actually sending Ben to the UK so he can see the movie before everyone else. In other news, we recently gave away a bunch of t-shirts to our top Patreon supporters, and uh, one of them, Josiah, decided that he wanted to give away his to you guys, so we're gonna match them and give away two t-shirts to you guys. Just like us on Facebook, and we'll randomly select you guys within the next week. All right, guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.